Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, before getting into the our uh, going over our current work on learning from human demonstrations, I'm going to give kind of a brief overview of everything we've done so far. Uh, next slide. So, like Priya mentioned, we're using StarCraft two, right? And and we felt uh, that StarCraft two, while it is a game, has some uh, you know positives and advantages for studying this type of control, specifically for training AI that can learn battlefield strategies and wargaming. Uh, but in order for it to be more useful for us, we've made some modifications. And some of those, you know, the, the primary modification is that we're not actually doing the full game of StarCraft II that has an economy-based system, right, to where you're, you're collecting minerals and building units. Instead, we're, we've carved out a more tactical scenario that Priya went over you know, modeling after this uh, Tiger Claw scenario, you know, so that we can really kind of capture the, the essence of the command and control that we're looking for. We've also made other modifications, like we've we've kind of reskinned the game uh, several times. We uh, militarized it a bit more, um, kind of added in these military icons, and then adjusted the the parameters and attributes of the individual Starcraft units to kind of match you know, the, the type of uh, weapons and range and scaling that, that we're looking for. And then, of course, we've uh, modified the internal game score to kind of serve as our reward function to facilitate learning. Next slide. Um, you can advance this to the end, Bria. So, um, you know, the first thing that we had to do to make StarCraft kind of feasible for, for learning this, you know, kind of wrap it in this gym interface. And so, you know, most of you might be familiar with the gym interface is just a standard, you know, protocol for facilitating, you know, learning of an AI agent, typically reinforcement learning uh, with some sort of task or environment. Um, it handles, you know, basically the output uh, of that environment, what the agent sees, and then, you know, when the agent takes actions, it, it handles those actions and, and steps forward through the environment. So we developed this gym, gym uh, wrapper, right, to kind of, uh, sit in between our AI agent and the StarCraft game engine. Um, and so we kind of uh, developed a state space that consists primarily of uh, overhead kind of images. In this case, the, the images of the StarCraft II game or like the battlefield, right? Those images would, um, as well as other non-spatial features, right? Um, will be like the input representation to our AI agent. So it's basically how the AI agent is able to see the battlefield. And then we defined a set of actions um, for our autonomous agent of, you know, attacking, holding, moving, patrolling, stuff like that. And then most importantly, a reward function. Uh, and so this reward function really dictates the, you know, the behavior uh, that the agent will ultimately have, because when we're applying techniques like reinforcement learning on it, our ultimate goal is to, you know, for, for that agent is to try to learn a policy um, to increase the amount of reward that agent gets to maximally increase that reward. And so the reward function, we, we've tweaked and, and, and kind of shaped this reward function uh, many times, but the base of that reward function is basically we're positively rewarding or encouraging the agent to, uh, to seek out and, and um, get uh, opt for uh, ca casualties or to basically just uh, seek out and destroy the enemy. We're also rewarding our agent to kind of preserve its own forces. So we negatively re uh, reward it whenever uh, a blue force unit gets destroyed. And then we're kind of adding, you know, in this territory based rewards where we uh, reward or, uh, the agent for entering certain zones within the, within the battle space. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to just go over real quickly like the uh, a brief overview of the nuts and bolts of our core deep reinforcement learning agent that we're using. You can see on, on the right. So we're, we're really using kind of this multi input multi-output neural network, right, to accommodate the complex nature, uh, state and action space of the StarCraft II game engine. Like I said, the state has multiple screens as input. These are screens of, you know, overhead views of the battlefield, as well as other features, including, like, unit information and position, stuff like that. And then the output is also the action space that the agent can take is also uh, complicated because it's the, the agent can uh, apply different actions to different units and different locations of the map. And so we kind of designed this multi-input, multi-output neural network. And as the backbone for training, we're using the A3C Advantage Active Perk algorithm, um, which is just you know a, a more state-of-the-art active critic algorithm that we can uh, parallelize and, and 
um, and train to speed up training. Next slide. Or not that. Yeah, this one. Okay. So we've also developed this kind of state input processing layer, uh, like I said, to handle the multi input uh, state space that StarCraft provides. So it's kind of just multiple legs of convolutional layers for the input images, as well as fully connected layers for the non spatial features. And then we paired that with an LSTM module to, to give our agent memory capabilities. Next slide. Okay, so uh, kind of just jumping the gun real quick and showing, you know, when you take an agent such as this paired with that reward function and that gym interface and you train it uh, for a very long time, um, you know, this is kind of the learned policy that you get. So this is, you know, after training that deep reinforcement learning agent, it's kind of hard to see on the on the left, you see these dots moving, these kind of blue dots that start off on the left side, that's the blue force, and they're kind of moving uh, towards the red force, which is on the other side of the kind of uh, riverbed that's, that's, that you see this like vertical line. Um, and you can kind of see they, the, the blue force split up its forces, you know, uh, moving half to this northern crossing, the other half to the southern crossing, kind of like a pincer movement. And the objective again is kind of just cross this riverbed, uh, go over these land bridges and destroy any uh, enemy forces that they encounter. And you can see, you know, it's a you know more or less reasonable behavior, um, and it, you know shows that we can you know do the type of deep reinforcement learning. I think for this particular agent, it, it uh, takes about um, forty workers, like a couple days of training time. Um, so like million, it, you know, just to learn this behavior it takes millions and millions of. Uh, of samples, uh, thousands of playthroughs through this game, but we can, you know, you know, at least demonstrate some sort of reasonable behavior without any hard coded rules. So that's the other thing I want to say here: that nothing really hard coded about this agent. We didn't give it any prior information ahead of time. It learned everything from scratch. Next slide. Uh, so real quickly, I'm gonna, we've made a lot of uh, modifications to the visualizations. Like I said before. Uh, so in this video, in the bottom uh, panel of this video, you see these more cartoonish type uh, representations of of the game engine, and that's on the left side is the bottom left panel is the uh, you know basically the Linux version of of the StarCraft II game engine, and then the bottom right is is the Windows version. These are more kind of like the default uh, visualizations that come out of StarCraft. Now the top half of this video. Uh, these, this is what we get when after we uh, connect our uh, AI agent and the StarCraft game engine with uh, Aurora, which is, uh, so Aurora is a, another separate project um, that's uh, being developed at ARL. Basically, it's a XR, you know, AR, VR visualization platform uh, for, you know, visualizing battlefield data in a common operating picture. Um, and so you can see, you know, on the top, you know, we have we paired up our AI agent and we're doing rollouts. On the top uh, left is a VR interface, right, using Aurora, and on the top right is is more of just a overhead view. But what this gives us now is it, it gives us a another way to interact with humans. So now we can, you know, have our agents, you know, sim simulating the, the the battle or scenario, and we can have humans, you know, around the same table in VR. Uh, interacting with that agent, you know, gleaming information like battlefield strategies, but maybe also but what we hope in the future is enabling uh, future human autonomy interaction techniques where you might have like a, a commander um, interacting with this artificial commander, uh, you know, gleaming information or, or or helping to to you know get new battlefield strategies and stuff like that. Next slide. To facilitate our the training of our uh, deep reinforcement learning agents, we've you know, Tons of work to integrate our code to work with ARL's high performance computing resources. Um, and so, this again, you know, like I said, uh, deep reinforcement learning takes a lot of uh, data and computational uh, infrastructure. And so, what the ARL's HPC integration allows us to do is kind of really parallelize our experimentation so that we can rapidly iterate over uh, our new ideas and new algorithms. And so we're able to, you know, now massively parallelize our exper experiments and then, and then simulate multiple workers on a single node. And that really just allows the agent to, to train and explore a lot faster. 
Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to talk about, um, you know, some of our more recent work of really, you know, can we, you know, really speed up this training instead of learning completely from scratch? Can we kind of incorporate tacit knowledge from a human uh, commander into the AI? You know, and, and we're going to look at a technique called learn from human demonstration. Next slide. So, there's a lot of ways to do learning from human demonstrations. Uh, one of the most common ways is, you know, a technique called imitation learning. Um, and so, with imitation learning, you know, you, a very simple way to, 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 you know, do that type of learning is if you, you have some exemplar data. So, so, some human provides an example of the task that you want, the trajectory or demonstration. And then you can, you know, get that agent to try to mimic or learn that task by, you know, using techniques like behavior clone, right? Um, and so we kind of tried to start off with that, right? But the problem, you know, that's always plagued this type of imitation learning is that you need you generally a lot of high quality data, right? Uh, you run into problems where if, 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 if your RL agent or if your AI agent gets into a scenario that it, it wasn't demonstrated by the human, it's going to fail, right? Uh, and then, so I don't, I'm not showing any results of that. For, for this presentation, because most of our results using that type of imitation learning, uh, you know, more or less just didn't work, right? Uh, because, you know, with something like StarCraft, right, the complexity of the state and action space, it really takes a lot of human data. And we don't, if you don't provide that human data, right, which is sometimes not feasible to get, right, the agent's gonna fail. So it really forced us to kind of innovate, you know, on new ideas of, of okay, how can we, you know, still learn from a human? And so, really, we wanted to continue doing reinforcement learning because we knew, you know, while it's not as sample efficient uh, as we'd like to, it, you know, it has shown promise, right? And so, uh, we started looking into ideas of can we use human demonstration um, or, you know, dem uh, human demonstration to kind of guide that exploration of that reinforcement learning uh, using, you know, various techniques. And one of those techniques that I'll get into a little later, automatic uh, curriculum learning. So next slide. So the first thing again that we're we're doing is uh, we want to can we use prior knowledge to kind of improve our baseline reinforcement learning algorithms? It's that our reinforcement learning is going to be the backbone of our technique. We want to try to improve it as much as possible. And is there any way that we can actually use prior human knowledge to do that? And so we explored around with multiple techniques. One of those where uh, we used um, you know human knowledge to kind of pre-select or you know engineer a bit better uh, state space, right? Where we condense the state space and, and select relevant information. Um, and we also made the, uh, optimizations in how the our AI agent can control those forces. Uh, so in everything that I've talked about for now, like the AI agent's just been controlling forces individually, but we made modifications and so now our AI agent control groups of forces. That's kind of what you see at the bottom right image where these blue squares we kind of give our agent the ability to to group up and control different uh, uh, heterogeneous coalitions, right? Um, and then we've also explored uh, different techniques like autoaggressive discretization for the action space, right? The action space of this game is very very difficult because it's very very large, and so if we can kind of use techniques to kind of help minimize that, um, you know, hopefully we can we can get improvement to that learning. Next slide. So this is kind of showing that we can, you know, improve our reinforcement learning policy compared to, you know, specifically what we did in year one. Um, so if you look at the, the top left graph, these are so this is a, a line plot uh, showing episode reward or, or the score that the agent received on the game where higher is better uh, versus training time, right? You can see uh, these, these blue and Orange curves are, are our original A3C agent, and and this green curve is the agent with you know these various improvements and optimizations that I talked about before, right? Improving the state space and, and improving that the way that the action space, the way the agent is able to control the, the units. So we're able to you know improve our our learning by a significant margin, which is good. But you can see in this bar plot on the bottom right. Um, this horizontal green line right now is our best reinforcement learning policy, and and, and uh, these bars are are basically individual human trials, so human runs. So the agent is doing better, but it's still 
not as good as human performance, right? So we want to see if we can close that gap. Next slide. Okay, so um, so I talked about a technique that we're trying to basically use human demonstrations to explore learning, but we're doing that using curriculum learning. Curriculum learning is very simple concept. You know, if you, you decomposes very complex tasks into simpler tasks that are easier to optimize over for a learning agent. So in this example, if you wanted to train an agent, uh, train a four-legged quadruped robot to walk up and down stairs, you know, first you want to train it to be able to walk on flat terrain, right? Um, it's a much easier task and then, then train it to walk on, you know, slightly uneven terrain or individual steps and then keep increasing the complexity of that task as the agent gets more proficient until you get to your final uh, end task. Next slide. So the difficult thing about uh, curriculum learning is, you know, how to define that curriculum and, you know, in that uh, steps example, maybe that was a pretty easy way to define the curriculum, but for other tasks, it might not be so obvious of, you know, what is an easier and smooth curriculum for the agent to follow. And so we're following a technique where it was shown on a very simplified environment, in this case, Atari, so you can see this Atari image, that you can use maybe uh, human demonstrations to kind of be the backbone to seed that curriculum, right? So in this case, for the for the uh, Atari, this is Montezuma's Revenge, right? Uh, having that uh, moving the avatar that's currently standing on the stairs to grab the key is a very long sequence of events that's very uh, maybe difficult for the agent to learn on its own. And so with this technique, you know, you have a human demonstrate demonstrate that route, and then you break that up into different pieces, right? So you start the the agent right next to the key. And then all it has to do is learn to jump, uh, which is a very simple task at that point. And once it learns that enough, then you move the agent back in time, uh, like starting off where that red arrow is, and then it just needs to go up the ladder. And then once it learned that, then you move it back more and more and more until it's all the way at the start, right? Next slide. So that's basically uh, the approach that we took here, right? Uh, we wanna use these human demonstrations and specifically, really just a single human demonstration, right? Demonstrating the task and using that as a, a guide for our curriculum learning. Uh, so a, a natural curriculum where we would, you know, start off the Tiger Call scenario right at the end, right before uh, the game has been won from that human demonstration point of view and start our uh, reinforcement learning, learning at that point. And then once we gain proficiency there, then we move back in time a little bit along that demonstration and then start learning there and, and so on and so forth. Next slide. So this is just kind of a, a visual demonstration of, of how we took the you know single human demonstration and de decomposed it into these subtasks. And the advantage here is that we're, you know is a type of uh, learning from human demonstration, but it only requires one demonstration. Uh, so there's a huge advantage, right? Because then we can you know, it's a lot easier to get uh, one really good demonstration than to try to get a, a whole bunch of demonstrations. Next slide. So uh, this is a plot showing kind of the, the results of the um, that automatic curriculum learning technique that I just described. So we can see uh, on the on the left side here, right? This the again, both of these are these are the episode reward. Higher is better, right? Uh, this horizontal red line. Um, is the, the the human performance that I showed before, and you can now see the blue this blue curve is the automatic curriculum learning. So we're able to get just up to, to human performance, uh, which we weren't able to get to before, as I showed in the previous slides. And on the right, if you look at the right side, so this is uh, important. So this really shows the the advantage that we get with the auto, automatic curriculum learning, which is the blue curve, compared to just traditional reinforcement learning, right, which is the orange curve. Um, Again, the orange curve is just straight up RL that isn't using any human uh, data and so learning completely from scratch. And the and the blue curve is RL that's learning from that human demonstration that we're providing it. And 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 you see we're getting the, exactly what we want. Where we're I mean, of course we're improving performance. That's great, but we're getting a big speed up in, of where we get to that performance rate. Right? Um, whereas the reinforcement learning, you know, we have to train for uh, millions more steps, and and maybe if we continue to train for millions and millions more steps, it might get up to the uh, to where the blue curve is. But but uh, you can see, you know, we're, this is exactly kind of what we hoped we'd get. And these are pretty recent results only within the last couple months. Uh, so we're very excited about this and we're 
Now, you know, continue to move in this direction because we're definitely not done here. But we want to, this is definitely the, the um, promising results for us. Next slide. And so here is now a video of that uh, policy, right? Uh, kind of like I showed before, but the video looks a lot different because, again, we're using ARL's Aurora system um, to, to show this ro to roll out, right? But you can see, uh, you know, the blue forces on the left, right? Um, which consists of multiple tank and infantry uh, platoons and a couple aviation platoons moving across this dry riverbed, attacking the opposing Red Force, right? Um, the first thing that it does, the Red Force has an aviation uh, uh, platoon that's very dangerous and lethal. And the first thing the Blue Force does is send its aviation tune, uh, platoon to go out and seek and destroy the Red Force aviation platoon. And once that Red Force Aviation Platoon is eliminated, now the Blue Force is able to send the rest of the remainder of its ground forces, like the tank and mechanized infantry platoon, to cross the dry riverbed uh, and engage the, the Red Forces. And then eventually, once it breaks through that front line, it goes and tries to seek out and engage the, the Red Force artillery in the back. Okay, uh, next slide. So now a little bit on uh, where we're going from this. So we have a lot of a uh, couple different future directions. I'll just talk about one of them. The first one is really, you know, incorporating uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. So everything that I've talked about so far has really just been single-agent reinforcement learning, where the AI has been the artificial commander controlling all the forces. And so now we're exploring uh, how we can incorporate multi-agent RL, where really we'll have a learning agent controlling each individual unit, right? And so you'll have like a separate neural network controlling each unit. And then we, you know, those units will then have to learn how to coordinate their behavior. Uh, but in some sense, it's a lot more realistic of what would actually happen. And, and, and what we hope to get is after we kind of get this multi agent reinforcement learning done, we want to explore hybrid techniques where we have some sort of a hierarchical structure of a centralized uh, commander, right? Providing input uh, to some uh, decentralized set of. Uh, agents that on the battlefield, right, and having them work together, um, you know, to efficiently, uh, you know, do the scenario or the the objective. And so for this, we're we're working with uh, Smack, the StarCraft Multi Agent Challenge. So it's a version, uh, it's an API, a gym interface for StarCraft Two that allows for this multi agent reinforcement learning. And we've ported the Tigerfall scenario that uh, into the Smack environment, and then we've done initial. Testing and training on this with just a small set of uh, blue and red forces. Next slide. And so that's this learning curve right here. Again, uh, we can see that we're getting the learning curve that is in the general direction of where we want to go. The agent, the multi agent reinforcement learning agent is, is learning. And so this is promising results. Um, again, this is just a standard off the shelf moral algorithm, but now applied to this tangible scenario. So, um, where we want to go from there is, can we, you know, again, move away? We don't want to just have the the agent just learn from learn everything from scratch. We want to incorporate as much human knowledge and army doctrine as possible, right? And so we're exploring techniques of how we can, you know, introduce that knowledge, specifically army doctrine, right, uh, into the AI agent and have kind of a hybrid where we have a AI agent that that follows these rules and these doctrine, but also you know, is a learning based agent, right? That can uh, learn policies and strategies that utilize them. It, you know, so we we just started this work. We, we're we still learning exactly the best way to do things. But one example of what uh, one way to do this, if you can see these orange or these gray circles right here on the bottom right. So like if, if, if a tank platoon uh, is moving, is maneuvering from one position to the next in some enemy territory, you know, they're not just going to arbitrarily, you know, that tank platoon might consist of four or five tanks. They're not just going to arbitrarily move in, with no formation. They're going to, you know, follow a specific formation, you know, uh, like a V formation that has specific advantages for cover fire and stuff like that and protection. Um, and, 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 and so this is exactly what would actually be done, but we don't want the agent to have to spend a lot of time to learn that. Can we, you know, provide that information a priori? Right, so that we can speed up learning uh, further. So that's just a kind of an example of how we were thinking about uh, providing that information. So overall, just this is about I think my last slide. Just summarizing, uh, you know, 
on the StarCraft II side, right, for AI command control, we're showing that deep reinforcement learning can be used to learn these reasonable policies, right? Um, and we can, you know, get a speed up to deep reinforcement learning when we use learning from human demonstrations to guide that learning through a curriculum learning technique. Uh, and then we're, you know, exploring now, can we do a more realistic learning with multi-agent R O and incorporating doctrine-based knowledge? And now I think I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Anne, to talk about our work in OPSI. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Anne Mogi. I'm a computer scientist at ARL, and I'm going to be presenting the second thrust of the DSI research. Um, uh, so over the past year, um, you can stay on that slide. Um, over the past year, we've been investigating techniques for training an adaptive AI commander associate to perform well when the dynamics of a battle change. Um, and as uh, Priya alluded to earlier, uh, we're using a second simulator called Opsim for this thrust of the research. Next slide. Um, before I dive into the research, uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about the simulator we've been using. Um, first off, uh, Opsim is a, a plugin to Sitaware. And Sitaware is a command and control software that ingests information across services to build a common operating picture of a battle or engagement that can be shared across echelons. Um, it was used to build the tiger claw scenario, and the tiger claw scenario we've been using is um, similar to what was described um, by, by Priya and by the StarCraft team. Um, in this scenario, uh, Blue Force starts in the, in, in the west with a, an objective to secure two crossing sites on the wadi for a bigger force to come through. Um, and it also attempts to destroy uh, enemy forces in their path. Um, and then Op4 uh, starts in the east, and their objective is to uh, move to a defensive stronghold locations to prevent the Blue Force advance. Next slide. So Opsim is a traditional army battle simulator developed by Cole Engineering as a plugin for Sitaware. Um, it ingests a plan built in Sitaware that includes operational information for an engagement. Uh, it can then play out that battle in simulation. It has sophisticated rules for who can engage who and follows standard army doctrine to simulate battles in this space. Um, another thing that uh, made uh, Opsim really attractive for deep reinforcement learning um, is that it can run at speeds of more than a million times real time, which is really important when you're trying to train on uh, hundreds of thousands of, of simulations. Um, so Opsim is a stochastic simulator, so meaning uh, giving, given the same conditions, it generates different results for the battle. So here I'm showing the attrition in nine simulations. The top images, um, Blue 4 has a, a Fewer losses than uh, than op four, but then on the bottom right, op four does does a little bit better. Um, next slide. So Opsum allows you to select um, different pairings of commanders, and those uh, commanders can be of uh, one of two types. Uh, the first type of commander is expert system controlled, um, and that follows courses of actions. Uh, this was the original type of commanders associate Opsum was designed to support. And the second type of commander's associate is an AI controlled, which we worked closely with Cole Engineering to add in the first year of the project. Um, the AI controlled commander's associate is trained using deep reinforcement learning. And here I'm showing DRL was incorporated into, into OpSim using OpenAI Gen. And each of the forces can be controlled by uh, different AI commander associates. Um, so I'm also showing here uh, the observation space, the action space, and the reward. And the observation space describes the state of each entity in the world and includes things like position, damage, and engagement status. Um, the action space uh, consists of two different types of actions, movement actions and firing actions. And then the reward is composed of three different components, including protect self, attack enemy, and go to destination. Next slide. Um, so the experiments that I'm going to show in this uh, um, presentation were done with a Blue 4 AI and an op4 expert system. But what I'm showing here is that we also have experimental capabilities, including imitation learning, uh, Blue 4 AI versus op4 AI, and uh, Blue 4 expert system versus op4 AI. Next slide. So some of our goals in the first year of the project included incorporating DRL into OpSim and then training a preliminary policy. And here I'm showing some of our results. Um, the video shows a Blue 4 AI engaging an op4 expert system. And um, what you'll notice is a Blue 4 AI only directs the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta tank units, which are Blue 4's more lethal units, to move east uh, to destroy the opposing force. Um, another thing you'll notice is that the Blue 4 AI um, does not order um, all the units participate in the engagement, as you can see from all the units that are held back in the top left of the video. 
And this strategy is very different from an engagement where units movements follow army doctrine. Um, and looking at the plot on the right, it, it it, even though it doesn't follow army doctrine, it actually does really well at sustaining fewer losses and destroying uh, more op for than um, when we when an expert system, a blue four expert system was against a uh, op four expert system. Traditional DRL is focused on high reward and good win rate. And this strategy was sufficient to achieve that, but not sufficient for C2 because soldiers won't trust something that doesn't follow doctrine. We need an AI commander associate that can, you know, win as well and, and you know, protect its assets um, as well as destroying um, more enemies is the same way this was able to achieve it, but in ways that soldiers are comfortable with. Um, so you'll see later in the presentation, this year we came closer to this more realistic AI. So a quick summary of what emerged from this initial policy is Blue 4 was able to defeat Ob 4, um, but it relied very heavily on, uh, on only a few of its most lethal entities to win the battle. It commanded those useless movements you saw on the, the top left of the, uh, the video. It ignored final target locations for all entities, and it failed to secure areas of passage, passage lines. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this past year, which was the second year of the project, we developed a more realistic AI commander's associate, and we did so specifically by improving the state representation and the training regime. We scaled experiments with improvements on a high performance computer. As, and as part of um, the analysis, a military subject matter exer expert um, confirmed that our, our AI's policy um, performed much more closely to military doctrine than a policy trained in, in year one that you saw earlier. Um, second, we, we probe generalization limits. Um, we did this using uh, two techniques. Uh, we used curriculum learning and domain randomization and applied them to changes in the adversary's rules of engagement and uh, the adversary's equipment holdings, respectively. Next slide. So um, uh, here is some results from the second year of the project. The Blue 4 AI trains on about 600,000 simulated battles and employs uh, three strategies to use against the Op 4 expert system. First, um, the, the foremost uh, lethal units, including three armored tank companies and one mechanized infantry company, lead the attack and weaker units follow behind. Uh, second, the AI Commander Associate uh, prioritizes Op 4 units that pose the greatest threat, um, and they divide the engagement to three uh, distinct trajectories, um, Objective Bear, Objective Line West, and Objective Line East that you heard uh, Priya talk about earlier. These trajectories match the uh, phase lines uh, included in the Tiger Claw Op Board. Um, the AI Commander Associate uh, has no notion of phase lines and was able to independently discover these trajectories on its own. So um, the third strategy that came out of this was the AI Commander Associate sends uh, one of the armored companies to cross the northern section of the Wadi. Um, and this choice incurs a movement penalty, uh, but it also indicates the AI Commander may be trying to avoid detection and destroy the Op 4 artillery fire that's um, up in the, uh, the top right corner of the video. The plot to the right shows that the Blue 4 AI significantly reduces losses and destroys more Op 4 units against uh, an Op 4 expert system as compared to a uh, Blue 4 expert system against an Op 4 expert system. Next slide. So in order to make um, an AI commander associate more military relevant, we updated the state representation and the training regime. Um, we improved the observation of the environment to better condition the learning algorithm. Um, and this included normalizing the observations. Uh, we implemented uh, simulation specific rules to help constrain the action space. And this included things like a unit cannot fire at an enemy that it does not perceive. Um, if it doesn't have a fires relation, it cannot you know, use to call the action, call for fire action. Um, we also created a new uh, uh, reward function that better captures the objectives of the op org and eases credit assignment to specific uh, entity actions. Um, we scaled the infrastructure to parallel on uh, in parallel to, uh, on HP, uh, high performance computer system computer system, which enabled us to ramp up hundreds of experiments in parallel. And also, modern RL is sens sensitive to hyperparameters, so we did some hyperparameter tuning, tuning as well. Um, next slide. Yeah. Not here, Ryan. We can't see the slides. Yeah. Yes, now we can see it. Oh, yeah. perfect. Okay. Uh, yes, next slide. Um, so, in our first set of generalization experiments, uh, we trained a 
uh, blue four I against a op four extra system. And this uh, op four followed uh, a passive rules of engagement where the adversary does not fire first, it only returns counter fire. And so this was called weapon control status type. And then after training, the blue four performs uh, really well. It destroys most of the adversary in 100 battles and, and took very few losses. But when we trained that same blue, blue four, uh, uh, when the, the same trained blue four AI faced a more difficult trigger happy adversary, um, which is called weapon control status free, they, uh, they increased their losses, destroyed your opponents, and they, were, um, they failed to complete their mission. Uh, next slide. So then we used a type of curriculum learning to see what would happen if we trained blue four using uh, the easier adversary and then switched to training against a more difficult adversary. So in the top training curve, Blue 4 trained against the more difficult adversary and after 53 million steps achieved a reward of 1.62. Um, and in the bottom training curve, uh, Blue 4 trained against an easier adversary and then switched to training against the more difficult adversary. And you can see that in the training curve, uh, it reached a mean reward of 2.4 against the easier adversary. And then at the switch, 35 million time steps, it drops back down to the beginning of training. Um, so then over the course of 8 million time steps, steps, it recovers to a performance that took 15 million time steps in the top training curve, reaching a higher reward of 1.91 at 53 million time steps. Next slide. Um, so the Blue 4 was trained with a much larger equipment advantage. So we took the trained Blue 4 and tried halving and quartering the equipment holdings and found that it sustained higher losses, destroyed fewer Op 4 units, and was unable to complete its objectives. Next slide. So using um, a fixed value equipment count during training pr produced an overly aggressive Blue 4 AI that did not adapt to changes in the force ratio. So the next thing we wanted to train um, a policy by presenting with a variety of different force ratios to see if the commander's associate would adapt its strategy for both smaller and larger force ratios. So here I have highlighted um, Blue 4 B112 cab Abram tanks. And in the original Tiger Claw scenario, Blue 4 had 28 Abram tanks. Um, but in this experiment, at the beginning of each uh, battle simulation, it samples from a distribution whose expected value matches the value specified in the, in the um, uh, scenario. So I, I think there's an animation here. So can you, next slide, or I guess next, oh, there you go. So over more and more simulations, the policy is presented with a greater variety of force ratios. And then one more time, Priya, next slide, okay. Um, and so yeah, so it's more and more, and then one more, Priya. There we go. So over the course of a million simulation, the policy trains on a broad spectrum of different force ratios. Next slide. We did not run experiments modifying the Blue 4 equipment's holdings, but instead modified the Op 4's equipment holdings because uh, we are more likely to know the makeup of our own equipment than the adversaries. So the, so the first question we, we asked was, does a commander's associate trained with a variety of force ratios take fewer losses than one that was trained with a fixed ratio? Um, so we trained two policies. One policy was trained with a fixed uh, force ratio, and the second policy that was trained with a variety of force ratios, which we're calling the probabilistic policy. Um, then we evaluated, evaluated both using a variety of force ratios and found that the probabilistic policy had significantly fewer losses than the fixed policy. We also evaluated how they performed when we increased the equipment and found again that the probabil probabilistic policy with increased equipment had significantly fewer losses than the fixed, uh, fixed increased equipment. So the second question we wanted to ask um, is, does the commander's associate using the probabilistic policy perform better when facing a stronger adversary than observed during training? Um, and so what we wanted to see was we wanted to see a, a decrease for the, the fixed training condition and no change for the sample tra training condition. So if uh, next, I guess next slide, um, Priya. And so what we saw is that, yep, perfect. Um, and the answer is no, uh, no, that it looked like they both, um, rather than the conditions that we wanted to see, um, we saw actually more losses in both. But these are still really preliminary experiments and we've been um, working some new experiments from here to see if we can obtain different re results. Next slide. So the last thing I wanted to talk uh, talk about emerged in the process of using OpSim for DRL. Um, and we were not expecting it at the beginning of the program. The AI scaled out to explore and exploit and that combined with the intuition of human analysts accelerated um, accelerated the discovery uh, and remediation of several bugs that existed uh, for years within Opsin. Uh, these enhancements include scalability enhancements, scenario enhancements, such as uh, correcting mobility over the wadi. Um, when we first received Opsin, um, the movement over the wadi, which should be slower, was the same as every you know, the rest of the rest of the map. Um, but they've since uh, uh, fixed that bug, and it now reduces the speed on the wadi appropriately. 
Um, and then behavior enhancements such as uh, rule-based units. Um, before, when they had engaged with the enemy, they would not uh, disengage. They would get, they would be stuck, and they wouldn't be able to progress in the plan, um, and could not fire back. Among, uh, and this is just among uh, other bugs that are listed on the slide. So many of the discoveries we we made um, improved the expert system behavior rule engine, uh, which means even users who don't use RL capabilities better benefit from these discoveries. And so it could be adapted to accelerate the identification and remediation issues of um, many ARMY programs. Um, and, and that concludes my portion of the talk. Um, back over to you, Bria. OK, uh, that's all. Bria? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Uh, sure. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'll just go over one slide. This is uh, the the uh, plans for FY22. Um, so we plan to continue improving the core of DSI team at ARL. We uh, plan to continue to improve the generalization limits of AI commander associates. So we plan to focus more, more on new terrain conditions. Uh, for example, you know, what if there is a bridge burst or a smart landmine? Uh, will we still, uh, will the policies learned still be generalizable? So these are the type of experiments we plan to do. Uh, the second is uh, we ha now have preliminary results, like uh, Nick mentioned, that uh, the option-based multi-agent uh, uh, reinforcement learning shows promise in command and control application space, and it's uh, more realistic than a single-agent RN. So uh, the second research track we will uh, we'll be exploring is uh, using multi-agent reinforcement learning. Uh, third is, um, you know, RL combined with the demonstration uh, learning, uh, uh, you know, has uh, shown promise. And uh, uh, we will continue to explore the use of uh, learning by human demonstration with uh, RL for uh, speeding the uh, training time and reducing the unrealistic uh, behavior. So this is our plan for this coming year. Um, uh, so with this, uh, I will end. I think we pretty much... Uh, took all the time uh, for uh, if there are any questions yeah that's okay thank you thank you priya nick and Anne for the wonderful talk and uh, presenting us the work you have been doing at arl this is very informative and helpful for the faculty at the university of maryland so questions uh, from the audience uh, i know we are a little over time but we might be able to accommodate one or two questions if the speakers are available so any questions from the audience so Priya, I have a quick question. You talk about at the beginning, I noticed that about the synchronization issues. So can you uh, tell me a little bit about, is it synchronization at the packet level or is it something else? Like uh, in one of your slide, I noticed there were some uh, synchronization challenges at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, I got it. Uh, the, the previous slide, I think. The previous the rapid synchronization, oh, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, so uh, when we talk about rapid uh, synchronization, so uh, uh, again, um, it's uh, it's about uh, information coming from multiple domains, uh, multimodal okay. sensors, and mm -hmm. all this, and it's coming, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a hierarchical process within the military operating uh, environment where you have multiple echelon. So all this information needs to be synchronized uh, uh, to, uh, for the commander to for the commander to make uh, you know appropriate decisions. So that uh, again becomes a huge challenge when there is a limited amount of data coming in, uh, and uh, you know kind of synchronizing all this uh, and multi-domain. Uh, uh, most of the stuff we are doing right now is in physical domain, but you add that with the complexity of cyber, e electronic warfare, all these domains, uh, it becomes a lot more challenging. Thank you, thank you, Priya. Any questions from anyone else? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Maybe we can. Uh, Priya, do you have Priya Nick and Anne, Do you have a couple of minutes? We do. I do. Yep. Okay. Yep. Any questions from anyone oh, else? Hi. Yeah, hi. I, I have a question. So, <clears throat> did, thank you for the talk. That was very interesting. I, I was wondering whether, um, with this idea of trying to train AIs that um, perform as a um, commander in that case, right? Isn't there a risk of um, training a, a commander that wins the battle but loses the war? In the in the sense of, um, for example, I, I remember when the OpenAI and project um, use these uh, kind of techniques to learn how to win uh, Dota, Dota 2 games. 
and the AI learn things like uh, there's this unit that is um, less uh, uh, important than the rest that I can sacrifice. You know, I can put there, I can lure some of the humans to attack that unit. It, I will lose that unit, but then I will destroy the humans, right? So there might be some of these things that the AI uh, might end up learning. Uh, I don't know, in the context of the battlefield, like um, not only the aspect of sacrificing units, which might be apart from being morally wrong, it might have like long-term consequences, right? But maybe destroying infrastructure that maybe after the battle, the, the army would like to use. So there are all these things that are more like longitudinal, that is that go beyond the battle uh, and uh, that they, it might be difficult to learn for the AI. H have you thought about that? So I will I will let Nick answer, but this is my thought on it. Uh, so you're absolutely right, uh, and that is exactly you know one of the reasons why we feel human in the loop is so critical, right? Whether be it training or uh, coming up with uh, reward shaping and all this, uh, human in the training and uh, execution loop is very uh, important, so that uh, AI does not come up with plans that is uh, contrary to the human intuition or the commander's intuition. So I will let uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Nick and uh, Anne also, Chen. Yeah, I think it's a very good question, and I agree with uh, what Priya just said. Um, I think it's not an easy, it's a hard problem, right? It's kind of like you need to have the AI learn on multiple different uh, levels, echelons, and across multiple different time scales and very long time horizons. Um, it's something that we're definitely trying to keep in mind. I think, um, you know, we're we really see one of the ways we see this AI helping is is more of just like an artificial commander's assistant, right? And so we kind of see like you know traditionally you might have a commander that spends a lot of time working with other people trying to war game out uh, you know a course of action or or you know some sort of strategy for movement of forces or something like that, and that might be very labor intensive and take a lot of planning, and so. You know, one of the things we're hoping with this type of AI for command control is to kind of speed up that process. You know, maybe it's a, you know, like an assistant to that commander that can generate a bunch of different scenarios, you know, or a bunch, present a bunch of different strategies, present those to a commander and, the, and have the commander kind of uh, select or, or refine those strategies. Um, so, you know, really kind of speed up that wargaming and command and control uh, military decision making process, right? Um, and, you know, if you, like Bruce said, like, the goal is still to have the commander, the human commander in the loop, you know, so hopefully you won't lose sight of just winning the battle and losing the war, like you said. I think it's a very, very uh, interesting uh, problem. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from anyone else? Oh, Anne, do you want to add? Yeah, yeah, I had, I had I had two thoughts on it. Um, my first my first thought was um, that's something we kind of ran into in our in our first year when we were, were creating our first preliminary policy. And one of the things that we we gained sort of out of the second year is is really focusing a bit more in, in army doctrine because I think that takes into account a little bit more um, a, a thought into into some of those things. And the other thing I was thinking, and Priya and Nick, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think. Um, moving into the future, we're expecting to see a lot more robotic forces in, on, on the battlefield. And this could be something that could be used potentially for, for helping managing some of the those those forces uh, so as not to put human human forces at risk. Thank That's you. It. Thank you, Ann. Any any other quick questions uh, for our speaker? Okay. Uh, if not, I have a quick question for all of you, Priya and, and Nick. So, uh, do you have any plan to move forward with, with this uh, research on real systems? Like maybe uh, like small husky jackal or what frog and putting multiple of them and seeing how they are behaving. Uh, any plan or any division I have been implementing and taking your research from you and implementing on those systems? Yeah. Right. Uh, so the last two years, uh, I think most of the work has been in, you know, uh, simulation and environment, like you saw. Uh, but yes, uh, we are looking into that possibility of a transition. Uh, you know, transition could be in various different forms, right, uh, uh, to a, a more mature uh, technology. But one of them is, like you mentioned, uh, at least having some uh, preliminary uh, concept of 
taking this from simulation environment to real world environment, uh, which is a very challenging problem. Uh, you know, I, I think if you, if you look at the literature also, uh, translating uh, techniques like reinforcement learning from simulation to real world uh, has not been very successful in a lot of domains. It's probably in uh, robotic manipulators or a couple of, uh, you know, uh, problems that it has been successful. So yeah, yes, uh, we have plans to do that, uh, to kind of uh, show some pre preliminary proof that we can actually translate this to a uh, real world environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be mindful for everyone time and uh, we conclude today's seminar series for the Artemis uh, research team and, and it was wonderful to have you and we'll continue this seminar series. We are planning another one in the first week of December and as soon as I get confirmation from the speaker, I'll keep you all posted, but thank you and, and Nick and Priya for coming forward and, and, and starting the first seminar series of Artemis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.